And we are back for prepping for winter with our Theon sample chapter. Before we continue with part two, I'd like to mention something I missed last time about Stannis Sani's contract with the Iron Bank in Blood. A few of you wrote comments about how this parallels Tyrion signing his contract with the Second Sons in Blood as well, and it certainly does. What's interesting is that in both situations, we have men who are essentially lost and bankrupt, signing contracts and promising huge sums of money that they don't really have, and frankly, will likely never have. And in both situations, we don't actually know who is conning whom. At first glance, it seems like the Iron Bank and the Second Sons are getting huge sums of money, that they're somehow exploiting our characters. But honestly, does Stannis really plan on paying back the Iron Bank? Does Tyrion really plan on paying back the Second Sons? Or do both Tyrion and Stannis plan on using these institutions and then double-crossing them? I wonder this because of the action of signing in blood. This seems to be done as a show of sincerity, but ironically, actions of sincerity are only needed by the untrustworthy. By saying, trust me, one implies that there is a reason not to trust you. And if someone is untrustworthy, why would you trust an action of sincerity from them? We know that both Stannis and Tyrion lie to people. And would signing something in blood really dissuade either man from lying again or double-crossing someone? Anyway, we will get to Stannis' possible deceptions. Crow food. Theon remembered. An old man, huge and powerful, with a ruddy face and a shaggy white beard. He had been seated on a garron, clad in the pelt of a gigantic snow bear, its head his hood. So again, we have another mention of Theon's memory, but in this case, Theon does recall. Theon tells us that Moore's Umber was there to save Theon and Jane. Moore's knew exactly where to be, which, as we said last time, seems to imply that there was some sort of coordination with Mance Raider. Of all of the possible conspiracies going on in our story, a Manderly Umber Mance Raider conspiracy seems the most likely. Mance Raider snuck into Winterfell with the Manderleys, and Theon then landed with the Umbers. And the Manderleys and the Umbers have been working on building ships together since a Clash of Kings. What happened to these ships is a mystery. It's important to note that Umber is actually wearing a polar bear pelt. Of course, there are no polar bears south of the Wall. This means that Moore's Umber trades with the Wildlings. This is actually a big deal. Mance Raider said he crossed the Wall 50 times, and some call him The Mance, implying that he has relations with the Hill Clans. It seems quite likely that Mance Raider and the Wildlings were working diplomacy south of the Wall for quite some time. To what end, it's hard to say. Under it, he wore a stained white leather eye patch that reminded Theon of his uncle Euron. He wanted to rip it off Umber's face to make certain that underneath was only an empty eye socket, not a black eye shining with malice. Now this is a very interesting section. Prior to this, Theon had said very little about his uncle Euron. And here it's revealed that Theon, back in his boyhood, had seen Euron's black eye and knew it as an eye of malice. This is the first time we get a hint of Theon's fear of his uncle. Keep in mind, Moore's Umber should be seen as a savior. This is Theon's salvation from Ramsay. But Theon's first impression of Moore's Umber is wanting to rip his eye patch off his face to ensure it isn't Euron. Now we know that Euron had molested his younger brothers Aaron and Yuri, and Theon seems to have serious memory problems dating back to his childhood. And now things appear to make a bit more sense. Theon was likely also molested by Euron and has repressed memories about his childhood. This would explain why Theon could not remember the face of his sister and forgot about the Iron Price. Much of his childhood is repressed, to shield him from remembering Euron's actions. Now there's some dark humor here as well. Theon wants to make sure that it's just an empty eye socket underneath instead of a black eye. In fact, Moore's Umber has an obsidian eye underneath the patch. So had Theon actually torn off the patch, he would have been absolutely horrified. Instead, he had whimpered through his broken teeth and said, I am a turncloak and a kinslayer, Crowfood had finished. You will hold that lying tongue or lose it. Now here, Moore's Umber calls Theon a kinslayer. If Theon did kill his own son with the Miller's boys, this seems to be more evidence of a Manderly Umber Mance Raider conspiracy. Remember, the only person who would know about Theon's potential kinslaying would be Wex, who slept in the same room as Theon, and would hear Theon talk in his sleep. And Wex then found his way to the Manderleys where he was interviewed. The only other people to call Theon a kinslayer were Mance's spearwives and the mysterious hooded man in Winterfell. Now it seems the Umbers know the secret, and we have to question whether or not Stannis knows the secret. Anyway, Moores then tells Theon to shut up and begins to ask Jane about some Winterfell trivia. But Umber had looked at the girl closely, squinting down with his one good eye. You are the younger daughter? And Jane had nodded. Arya. My name is Arya. 
What's interesting about this exchange is how heavily related to Sansa it is. First of all, quizzing someone on their identity parallels Miranda Royce quizzing Sansa as they came down from the Eyrie. Sansa failed pretty miserably in that exchange. Jane's success is a bit more ambiguous. And here Morris calls Jane the younger daughter, which highlights the existence of an older daughter, Sansa, who would have a better claim to Winterfell than Arya. Arya of Winterfell, aye. When last I was inside those walls, your cook served us a steak and kidney pie. Made with ale, I think. Best I ever tasted. What was his name, that cook? Gage, Jane said at once. He was a good cook. He would make lemon cakes for Sansa whenever we had lemons. Now here Morse Umber is lying. The last time he was in Winterfell was the Harvest Festival, and the pie served was venison, carrots, and bacon. Morse Umber clearly did not remember any noteworthy pie and should have no idea who the cook was. Gage the cook and Osha, though, were banging. If there was one name Osha would know in Winterfell, it's his. This seems to be evidence that the Umbers have Rickon and Osha in their possession, so perhaps Davos was successful. That, or Rickon and Osha never went to Skagos in the first place. Now this is probably way too subtle for Moore's Umber to catch, but the real Arya loved lemon cakes too. So the real Arya probably wouldn't have mentioned that Sansa liked lemon cakes when she liked them enough in her own right. Crowfood had fingered his beard. Dead now, I suppose. That smith of yours as well. A man who knew his steel. What was his name? Jane had hesitated. Micken, Theon thought. His name was Micken. The castle blacksmith had never made any lemon cakes for Sansa, which made him far less important than the castle cook in the sweet little world she had shared with her friend Jane Poole. Remember, damn you, your father was the steward. He had charge of the whole household. The smith's name was Micken. 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 I had put him to death before me. Micken, Jane said. And here's a second signal that Rickon and Osha are in the Umber's possession. The sword that Osha took from the crypts of Winterfell was the sword put on Ned's tomb. It being a new sword, it bore Micken's mark. And why would Moore's Umber know that Micken knew his steel unless he had some of Micken's steel in his possession? So Moore's Umber has now asked a question related to Osha's sword and Osha's lover. Now Gage being dead is a supposition. We never actually see or hear of his death. The same is true of Jane Poole's father, Van Poole. They just sort of disappear from our story. Probably dead, but you never know. After all, Wex came back. Weirdly, Theon shows bitterness towards Sansa in this passage. Somehow, Jane not remembering Micken's name is Sansa's fault because Sansa was more interested in lemon cakes. Theon's anger, though, may just be driven by guilt over the death of Micken. Now, I do wonder if Jane's answer outed her or not. Theon implies that little girls wouldn't know the blacksmith's name. And in fact, Jane only really knows the name because her father was the steward. So ironically, Jane's answer might have outed her because she knew too much. But on the other hand, Arya actually was a tomboy and did know who Micken was. But did Moore's Umber know that Arya was a tomboy? So again, it's hard to tell if Jane was successful or not. Moore's Umber had grunted. Aye. What he might have said or done next, Theon never learned. For that was when the boy ran up clutching a spear and shouting that the portcullis on Winterfell's main gate was rising, and how Crowfood had grinned at that. Moore's Umber is grinning because he had laid a trap for the Freys to fall into. The snows had hidden pits that the Umbers had dug, and Aenys Frey and some of his men had fallen in. The Manderleys, who left at the same time, though, were unharmed, because they went out a side gate. This is another piece of evidence that a manderly umber Mance Raider conspiracy is going on. Now the presence of this conspiracy makes it uncertain if Moore's Umber knows that Arya is a fake. For Theon, it's obvious, but it's hard to say what other people believe. We know that Wyman Manderly met Arya once, and he has seen Jane at the wedding. One would think that if there was a manderly umber conspiracy, this information would have been communicated. Then again, maybe Wyman Manderly didn't remember Arya, or maybe he is playing his own game. I do find it curious that the Umber men are using spears. Certain cultures like the Wildlings and the Dornish use spears, and spearmen can be useful if used in mass. However, the Umbers don't really have that many men. Maybe the Umber Green Boys are looking for a greater range, or maybe the Umbers are just culturally closer to the Wildlings and prefer the spear. Whatever the case, it's curious. Theon twisted in his chains and blinked down at the king. Crowfood found us, yes. He sent us here to you, but it was me who saved her. Ask her yourself. So George R. Martin uses the term blinked to mean puzzled or taken aback by. And Theon is puzzled why Stannis is treating him so poorly. 
In Theon's mind, Stannis owes him. But this, again, is not Stannis' way. Just as Stannis never paid Salador Sand for anything and cursed him for abandoning him, Stannis feels he doesn't owe Theon anything. Or at least, wants Theon to think that. She would tell him, You saved me, Jane had whispered as he was carrying her through the snow. She was pale with pain, but she had brushed one hand across his cheek and smiled. I saved Lady Arya, Theon whispered back at her. And then, all at once, Moore's Umber's spears were all around them. Now this is a weird passage. It's hard to imagine Theon having the strength to carry Jane Poole very far. And Jane's phrase, you saved me, is also an odd, overly romanticized thing for Jane to say when she had just been landed on by Theon and is suffering some broken ribs. Not to mention, it's a bit premature on being saved considering they were only just outside the castle. Jane had been crying and screaming before the jump, so I do wonder if Jane really said what Theon thinks she said, or if he's just telling himself that. And that extra assurance she would tell him is a phrase of self-convincing. Now Theon's last words to Jane are for her to maintain the Arya charade. This charade obviously gets back to the famous Varys riddle of who has power, the king, the priest, or the rich man. Power resides where people think it resides, and Jane Poole only has power if people think she has power, like Stannis' kingship or like the contract Stannis signed. But Theon's words to Jane also show a bit of selfishness. Theon wouldn't have necessarily saved Jane Poole. He saved Lady Arya, because she has use to him. I suppose the real Theon is in fact returning. Is this my thanks? He asked Stannis, kicking feebly against the wall. His shoulders were in agony. His own weight was tearing them from their sockets. How long had he been hanging here? Was it still night outside? The tower was windowless. He had no way to know. Now Theon kicks the wall feebly on a couple of occasions in this chapter. One certainly gets the impression that Theon is weak and frail. Again, not really in the condition to carry Jane Poole. Theon also wonders how long he's been in the tower. I'm guessing just the night and now it's just past dawn. Stannis was speaking of having breakfast with the Karstarks. Interestingly, this is the second time Theon notes that the tower was windowless. Now, I will say our author is fond of the adjective windowless, often using it to evoke a dungeon-like feel to places. And this is Theon's dungeon in a sense, even reminding him of the Dreadfort. But I will say windowless buildings are not really that common in the real world, presently or historically. In the world of Ice and Fire, though, they are very common. Castle Black, Vase Toloro, the Pyramids of Marine, the Quiet Isle, the Shadow City of Sunspear, the House of Black and White, Warlock's Way and Karth, the House of the Undying, much of Storm's End and Casterly Rock. This, along with the fact that so much of the world is subterranean, makes me wonder if all of these were bunkers at one time, protecting people from either a cold winter, dragon fire, or perhaps even nuclear war. I'm not sure why a village needs a windowless beacon tower. Beacon for what? Now I should also mention that there are only two other windowless towers in our story. There's the tower that Harlan Greyjoy was housed in as he died of grayscale, and there's the windowless tower that Bran climbs in a dream. Unchain me and I will serve you! As you served Roose Bolton and Robb Stark? Stannis snorted. I think not. We have a warmer end in mind for you, Turncloak, but not until we're done with you. He means to kill me. The thought was queerly comforting. Death did not frighten Theon Greyjoy. Death would mean an end to the pain. Be done with me then, he urged the king. Take off my head and stick it on a spear. I slew Lord Eddard's son. I ought to die, but do it quick. He is coming. Here Stannis is again being overly harsh to Theon. Theon's betrayal of Robb Stark is one thing, but blaming Theon for betraying Roose Bolton? Come on, Theon was held captive and tortured by the Boltons, and then turn cloaked to Stannis in this case. And here Stannis is threatening to burn Theon. Again, it seems like Stannis is going overboard to try to scare Theon for some reason. Perhaps he just wants information, but it may be that Stannis wants something more. Now I think it's very, very important to note that Stannis once had an off-screen conversation with Mance Raider that must have been somewhat similar to this meeting between Stannis and Theon. With Mance, Stannis threatened to burn him and compelled him to do his bidding. Now we see the same with Theon. And so again I ask the question, what does Stannis want Theon to do? Now Stannis may not have that much leverage, as it appears that Theon wants to die. However, it's apparent that he doesn't want to burn, so here he's trying to bargain down Stannis to a beheading. 
Now there is a question to why Theon is still maintaining the charade that he killed the Stark boys instead of the Miller's boys. I suppose if he wants to die, he may want to maintain the image of being their killer. But later we find out that he maintained this lie for Asha as well. And he does this right before reaffirming that he's not a kinslayer. It seems that he is more scared of people thinking that he killed his own son than he is of people thinking that he killed Bran and Rickon. Who is coming? Bolton? Lord Ramsay! Theon hissed. The son, not the father! You must not let him take me! Roos? Roos is safe within the walls of Winterfell with his fat new wife. Ramsay is coming! Ramsay Snow, you mean! The bastard! Never call him that! Spittle sprayed from Theon's lips. Ramsay Bolton, not Ramsay Snow! Never Snow! Ever! You have to remember his name, or he will hurt you! He is welcome to try, whatever name he goes by. So Stannis has definitely hit a trigger for Theon's PTSD. But we know what Theon's been through, and so we know his PTSD is well justified. Interestingly, the most troubling aspect of this passage is Stannis' arrogance. He dismisses Ramsay when we all know that Ramsay is intelligent, formidable, and vicious. But Stannis' arrogance, in another sense, is astounding. We know his forces are malnourished and outnumbered, and the Boltons famously like to skin people. Why on earth wouldn't Stannis be scared? Isn't he in the much weaker position? Then again, this arrogance may be just a show to further scare Theon. Theon did spill the beans about his life to Asha in front of Tycho Nestoris, so therefore Stannis may know what scares Theon and what triggers him. Stannis may have used the term bastard intentionally. Now it should be noted that the stain of bastardy is shown to be hard to wash out. A king legitimized Ramsay, but he's still called Snow. And it's not just that Stannis doesn't recognize Lannister rule. Lady Dustin also called Ramsay a bastard, and the whole Blackfire Rebellion was based on the fact that many people think that a bastard is a bastard, regardless of legitimization. Many Septons even teach that as part of the Faith of the Seven. The issue of bastardy is somewhat apparent in how Theon perceives Roose Bolton's actions. Roose has his own life, Fat Walda, and his unborn, trueborn child, who will inherit the Dreadfort. Ramsay, being a bastard, sort of, is expendable and will be sent out to fight. The door opened with a gust of cold black wind and a swirl of snow. The Knight of the Moths had returned with the maester the king had sent for, his grey robes concealed beneath a heavy bearskin pelt. Behind them came two other knights, each carrying a raven in a cage. One was the man who'd been with Asha when the banker delivered him to her, a burly man with a winged pig on his surcoat. The other was taller, broad-shouldered, and brawny. The big man's breastplate was silvered steel, inlaid with niello. Though scratched and dinted, it still shone in the candlelight. The cloak that he wore over it was fastened with a burning heart. So here Maester Tybald is brought in, and Theon recognizes him as a maester, despite his cloak being hidden. And there's a reason Theon would know Tybald so intimately. Tybald was a maester at the Dreadfort, and would have treated Theon after his many injuries and amputations. It's somewhat brazen that Tybald is wearing a nice bear pelt. Maesters aren't supposed to wear fineries, but it's likely that Tybald, with the prefix Ty, is a Westerman, if not a Lannister. I do have to say that the Karstarks using the Dreadfort Maester and a Westerman is a massively boneheaded move. Now Tybald is surrounded by Stannis' three most loyal men, Richard Horp, Godry Faring, and Clayton Suggs, all known for their cruelty, fearlessness, and religious fervor. Now we've already talked about Richard Horp, but Clayton Suggs was a man who constantly harassed Asha. At the same time, he was ready to fight half a dozen mounted men when Theon arrived at the village. Godry Faring is the third knight, a hot-headed man who rode down a fleeing giant, and who was itching to fight Jon back at Castle Black. Suggs and Faring are loyal to Stannis and lusting for battle, but clearly do not have the self-control of Richard Horp or Justin Massey. Maester Tybald, announced the Knight of the Moths. The maester sank to his knees. He was red-haired and round-shouldered, with close-set eyes that kept flicking towards Theon hanging on the wall. Your Grace, how may I be of service? Stannis did not reply at once. He studied the man before him, his brow furrowed. Get up! The maester rose. You are the maester of the Dreadfort. How is it that you are here with us? Lord Arnulf brought me to tend his wounded. So here Tybald is brought in. He has red hair, so perhaps he's not a Lannister. His eyes keep going to Theon, so I assume he recognizes him. Now Stannis seems to know exactly who Tybald is. And although Tybald may think Theon outed him, he didn't. 
and John's letter wouldn't say anything about Tybald either. Stannis likely knows who Tybald is because Stannis seems to have studied the members of every household in Westeros. Plus, Stannis was raised by Maester Cresson and likely would have seen Tybald's writing over the years. But here's what's weird. If Theon didn't out Tybald and Jon's letter didn't out Tybald, Stannis must have known for a while that Tybald was the Dreadfort Maester. Why is Stannis confronting him now? Now, some may wonder why the Dreadfort Maester is with Arnarf Karstark and not the Karstark Maester. The answer is kind of simple. Maesters are loyal to the lords. Harry and Karstark is the Lord of Carhold, and Arnolf's whole plan is to join Stannis in hopes that the Lannisters will execute Harrion. Arnolf will then reveal that he was a double agent and take control of the Carhold. The Karstark Maester would not betray Harrion. So while it was boneheaded to bring along the Dreadfort Maester, it might have been unavoidable. They wanted reports on Stannis' movements and needed a Maester they could trust. And that's all for now. We'll continue on with Theon 1 in Part 3.